With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. From your favorite source for Chicago White Sox talk, delivering news, interviews, analysis, and more. This is the Sox Machine Podcast with your hosts, Jim Margulis, James Fegan, and Josh Nelson. Thanks, Rob, and welcome to a special edition of the Sox Machine Podcast. I'm Josh Nelson. This is a recording of our live show, Opening Day Eve, at the Remova Theater on March 27th, 2024. For Sox Machine, there are two segments. The first panel that I co-hosted with Courtney Finnecombe of the Baseball Isn't Boring podcast, part of the Odyssey Network. She's going to be launching a new podcast with former major leaguer Johnny Gomes and, of course, our best friend of the show, Lawrence Holmes from 670 The Score, Bernstein and Holmes, join me to talk about the Chicago White Sox and season expectations of 2024. Stand up because I'm more comfortable standing up and sitting down, just so you know. But I also brought treats because my my loss is your gain. So I brought I think six of my White Sox caps. I have cleaned them, so <laughs> I am giving them away so that you can have them because I've had quite enough. <laughs> Treats, but I will happily drink with all of you later. There you go. Yeah. It's a better treat. Thank you. Well, Courtney, I want to start with you because you have a new podcast coming out I do. with ex major leaguer Johnny Gomes of all players. So Speaking tell us about it. Speaking of Johnny Gomes, talk about a beer drinker. <laughs> that guy can take us all to school, even the one away crew. So I, I do love Johnny uh, Gomes. Yeah. to meet all you guys, and we can have some sort of beer drinking contest. Yes, that's exactly, especially with My Sox Summer. My Sox Summer loves beer. Okay. Octoberfest beer. Octoberfest beer. I'm an IPA girl. I'm an IPA girl. And so Johnny's an IPA guy, so we'll, we'll work this out. But yes, thank you, Josh. So I do the Baseball is a Boring podcast currently, and through that same umbrella, Johnny Gomes and I are kind of breaking apart and starting... A, the lovely, lovely names Pitch and Moan because, I mean, let's be honest, who doesn't like to pit, bitch and moan about baseball? I certainly do. So we... So it's a White Sox podcast. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. So there'll be a lot of bitching and moaning, I can assure you of that, and that came out today, so we are excited and thrilled to be with all of you tonight for sure. And Lawrence, you guys will be at Wings and Rings tomorrow, right? Yeah, I might, I might just leave my car here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to be on 10 and 2 tomorrow. It'll be me, Dan, and Layla. Like, I, I think Layla will be all like TV dressed up because she's going to leave here and then go, like, she works harder than anybody, I know, but yeah. she's going she's gonna to be there with us. We're going to have a good time. I love Wings and Rings, so it'll be good. I, I was actually shocked, to tell you the truth, when the score told us that we were doing a remote down here because I was like, who would pay for that? But <laughs> someone did, so I was like, oh, cool. We get to actually use a home game for me for once I don't have to travel. So it'll be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I'll see you at 1225. Cool. Yes. Come on through. I'll, I'll, you're on the schedule. Yes, I am on the schedule. I'll be there at 1225. Let's start with a softball question. My favorite Courtney, what are your expectations of the Chicago White Sox in 2024? Expectations. I mean, that is such a word that is being thrown around constantly, and it's hard to get excited about this team, right? I mean, this is a 100-plus loss team last year. 
And it's a team that struggles fundamentally. And really what I look for in this particular season, obviously, we know this is not gonna be a 90 win team, obviously. I am, <laughs> oh, negativity, already being negative. But I am such a fundamental, fundamental person. I look for good defense, I look for contact hitting, I look for moving the runner over. You know, I'm excited, cautiously excited, of course, to see better defense up the middle. Like, we actually have a shortstop, we have a second baseman, we finally have a real right fielder. What a concept. Yes. Now, thank you. Let's clap for a real right fielder, please. <laughs> clap for a real right fielder. I'm not kidding. Uh, I don't know if you saw Dylan Cease's reaction yes. to the Padres exhibition yeah. game when Fernando Tatis Jr. made that incredible play. He looked at Tatis, he's like, holy shit, you caught that? Uh, Lawrence, I am afraid to ask you the same question. <laughs> same. But what are your expectations for this season? Pain. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Joe Sheehan said uh, he could, you know, Dan can't stop reading Joe Sheehan. Um, he brought up that he thought that the White Sox would only win 53 games, and I was like, wow, like I think they're going to be terrible, but. Every team wins 60, right? So, like, for me, the over-under is 59 and a half. That's, that's what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over, but I understand anyone who goes under. Uh, I am not as excited about, about the bunting uh, as you are. I, I, I want people to swing for the fences, and I would love to see the White Sox develop into that. It's hard. Like, I don't... I'm not sure what White Sox fans should be watching this season. <laughs> and, and I'm not saying that as a joke. Like, I'm, I'm 100% for real. Like, other than our communal love of baseball and, like, the excitement of baseball being back and baseball on the South Side being back, that's about where it ends for me. I'm going to try to look at this season very clinically and see if we can find out if Pedro Grifol can manage. Nope. See? <laughs> I'm going to try and find out if Chris Guest knows what he's doing. Um, I, I'm talking to some people that have felt that he, he is someone that would have been on the list to be a general manager, but not for another three or four years of doing player development. So I, I don't know, like maybe he rises to the occasion, he's better than I think, and he can flip this thing around. I just hope that at the end of this, at the, if we're together again in August or September, my hope is that they're at least identifying players that will be here when the White Sox are good again. If that makes No, it does. Because August 23rd, circle that date on your calendar. That's within 45 days of the season. The White Sox can call up Colson Montgomery. He can play out the rest of the season, still maintain his rookie eligibility for 2025. My hope is that he's not rushed, though. Like, I'm, well, he's starting in AAA, baby. I, my, my thing is, when it comes to prospects anytime, but with Montgomery in particular, I don't want him pushed to the major leagues because he's all the White Sox have. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't. I don't want him to be thrust to the major league level because well, he's he's going to be a star. He has to come play. If he's not ready, it can damage him more than it can help him, especially considering the environment that he's going to be brought up in. I, I think that would be really bad. Can I can I argue that for a second? Absolutely. Okay, fabulous. Um, I, I understand what you're saying, but I have seen other teams bring up prospects pretty quickly. The Angels being one of them, the Yankees being one of them. I think at times, depending on the organization, being ready is a little overrated. I think if you can play ball, you can play ball. If you're, if you're a smart baseball player, you, you can do that. So I understand the concern. But we have seen other organizations do this, and it's not totally uncommon. 
But the White Sox way is the White Sox way, so well, I understand your concern, <laughs> sir. Other organizations are usually better at identifying <laughs> and developing the talent That's before correct. it comes to the major league. Because if you look even at the players that are on the roster now, there are a bunch of players that were, were not fully developed. If we go back to last year's team, and you look at the guys that we love from that team, all of those guys had some fatal flaw that you go, would that have been helped if they wouldn't have been pushed to the major leagues? Now, I think all of us agreed at the time that that was the move to make. That if you're gonna buy out our gears of players, then they gotta come to the major leagues. Some of them have been able to work it out. At least Robert worked it out at the major league level. But how many times did we see Tim Anderson, for example, make great plays but not make routine plays? Or how many times have we seen, we're, like, it's crazy to me that this will be Michael Kopech's 10th year of professional baseball. Yes, this is his 10th year of professional baseball. And no one knows if he's a starter or a reliever. And it's, and it's partially because we were all at Copac Day. Yes, you remember when yes. Copac got called up? That was an awesome day. Like that felt so good going to the yeah. ballpark. And and here, yeah, it's not like great. It's like the game. Of course, of course, of course. Obviously, the White Sox are in town if it's raining, as Hawk would say. <laughs> I'm ashamed of you for that. And and I, tried, I tried desperately to warn people last year about that. And it was, it was upsetting to, to see him. And you know what I didn't like? I, I felt like at the end of the year, he wasn't given an ample opportunity. Like, he's here. Keep playing. Thank you. Correct. I'm sorry. I'm hogging the time. I'm sorry. <laughs> It's like, point two. <laughs> Jim and James, you can talk. Uh, Just like you said, Lord, sometimes you gotta let guys work it out. You gotta let Oscar Paul work it out, but I am ashamed so far. So, moving from expectations, Chris Getz today was on foul territory. He was speaking to ex White Sox, AJ Brzezinski. And AJ, if you haven't got a chance to check out the interview, I highly recommend it. It's on YouTube because AJ grilled Chris Getz. That's like. Teammate on teammate, media violence. I gotta tell you, AJ is our avatar, man. Like, oh, yes, he is. He, he is out there with the access. Like, the thing I like about AJ is he can't be picked apart. The rest of us can be picked apart in one way or another. You know, we didn't play the game, or, you know, we don't know what we're talking about, even though a lot of us have been around baseball for a very long time, have been in dugouts, have talked to people who run baseball teams, like all of that stuff. Talk to people who play the game. He, his opinion cannot be dismissed by the White Sox because he checks every box. One, he cares about the White Sox and White Sox fans. Two, he played a high level in the major leagues. Three, he's a champion baseball player that won with his team. So I love that last year when shit was going sideways for the White Sox, AJ was the one being like, what is going on over there at 35th and Shield? So I really appreciate that he's out there telling the truth, that him and Ozzy are like the only two people around the White Sox that, that are telling the truth. It is, it's important that we have those voices out there. Yeah, because Getz was trying to start the, what Rick Hahn said last year, we have to regain the trust of the fans, and then Brzezinski just stopped him dead in the tracks and be like, that's what Rick Hahn said last year. You said you were different. Uh, let's start over again. What do you need to see, Courtney, to inspire faith in you that the White Sox are going down the right road, that this will be turned around and they will finally start building a ball club that wins more consistently? I mean, to put it bluntly, you need to see not the same bullshit. I, it's, it's really, it's really that simple. I, you know, I not to put over my own podcast, but I will. Please. <laughs> Thank you. I did interview Paige over fall last year, his rookie season, as a man, and, and he was 
giving me the same bullshit, but I'm still here to this day. You know, the same rah-rah bullshit. And it's like, put your money where your mouth is, and let's actually see a competent team on the field. Let's actually see you making the correct decisions with the bullpen, right? I mean, I see Brian Shaw pitching every single goddamn day again. Yes. yes. I am. Pedro's favorite Fleetwood Mac song? Well, I wish I know. <laughs> we talked restaurants. We didn't talk music, though. Kind of, yeah, that's a good point. Yes. I wonder what the best about Hansen is. We talked the vets. The vets stay house, so there's that. <laughs> Exactly. 
Gen Z. Because I joke all the time I'm technically Gen Z, because I'm totally down with all the terminology today. <laughs> but but with the with the current White Sox culture, like with Pedro, it's amazing to say he's on the hot seat entering year two. Like that's how bad last season was. And if you bring in so many veterans this year that are on one-year deals, and he is proclaiming that we are building culture. Courtney, how do you build a clubhouse culture if you're going to have 10 to 15 new faces next year? Doesn't culture mean sustainability, that it is the same type of roster that you have for three, four years? I mean, going back to AJ Brzezinski, 05, 06, 07, 08, 09, 10, like the White Sox had a consistent core, they had consistent leadership in that clubhouse, and they're going to overhaul this roster again after the season. And, and that's the scary part, too, is that we have a depleted farm system. So who's going to replace these one-year guys? Who's going to replace these one-year guys? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> He's getting White Sox. That's what I mean. All right, we have, we have Colson Montgomery coming up. I mean, what, what, what's, what's the next one? I feel I got seven innings left in this body. If they wanted to use that, that's all. Seven innings. I mean, I can catch seven innings. So they have to like dole it out. I would say like. Well, listen, that's most. That's more innings than a lot of our catchers can do. So I mean, you know, you and Ron Ball are. You know. Oh God. Okay. <laughs> so this has been a very optimistic, very positive conversation. Oh, I'm so sorry, man. <laughs> you brought two angry people here. I feel, I feel like I brought the rain cloud here. And I, <laughs> no, you didn't. You're Eeyore. <laughs> I think that, that the thing that I marvel at when it comes to the White Sox and White Sox fans is that you know we are small, but we are mighty. And I always like baseball. Like I'm a romantic when it comes to baseball, and I know that it doesn't sound like it when I'm talking about the White Sox. Um, but I love opening day and the concept of opening day is like a family reunion where everyone, we've gone our separate ways this football season and everything else, and then we got to kind of get to come back together for spring. And unfortunately, like, the outlook is, is grim for us, you know? Like, it's grim looking at what the White Sox might be in 2024. My hope is that they're, that we're all wrong. Like, that would be, like, one of the greatest stories ever. If we're all wrong and this kind of band of misfits was you know, able to you know, major league their way to... Because hey, I saw this movie. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't know who you have a picture of. Is it Jerry and a and Kong or something? Like, you know, taking the pieces off of that or... But it would be great if, if that would be the case, but it's, it's sad. So let's finish with this. What is your crazy ass prediction for the White Sox in 2024? Courtney, I'll start with you. If the White Sox somehow manage to win 75 games or more, Pedro Grifol, manager of the year. Wow. Okay. So we got Pedro Grifol, manager of the year. I think he'd be in the running if they did. <laughs> um, I am the last of the Moncada truthers. Lawrence has got hats. 
I think Nikki Lopez, Naperville's finest, will be a three-war player this year. Wait, and, did you say that Nikki Lopez was from Naperville's side of him? Yeah, shocker, right? Nobody knew that. You're in breaking news right now. So, so for the neighbor Thrill fans out there, I'm thinking Nikki Lopez will have a good year. Hey, is anyone seven and three eights? <laughs> I'm serious. Is so it? while Lawrence is talking on that, you're marvelous. Seven and three eights. While Lawrence is tossing out hats, again, huge thank you to Courtney Finnecom. I have never worn this one. This is the 2020 postseason. It just says 2020 postseason. Oh, I like it. So, Lawrence Saucy Caps, again, check out Baseball Is It Boring Podcast. Check out her new podcast, Bitch and Moan, yes. part of the Odyssey Network. So, Courtney, thank you so much. And Lawrence, again, be him. You can hear him all the time at 6 of the score at Bernstein at Home from 10 to 2. Weekdays, he'll be at Wings and Rings tomorrow. Check him out there. Lawrence and Courtney, again, thank you so much for coming. I'll be at the bar. Tonight. It's only a kick, a jump, a block, it's only a serve, it's only a tackle, a run, it's only for the fans. After all, it's only pressure. You got this. Adidas. Survivor 46 is here, and so is On Fire, the only official Survivor podcast, and we have a twist this season. The winner of Survivor 45, D. Valladares, will be joining us every week. We're going behind the scenes of the biggest moments, the how and the why things happen, and the strategy and analysis you can only get from someone like me, a Survivor winner. Listen to On Fire, the official Survivor podcast, wherever you get your podcast. The second segment, I'm joined by very familiar voices. Jim Margulis, the managing editor of SoxMachine.com, and, of course, James Fegan, our beat reporter, who was at the White Sox workout and got some additional intel for us prior to opening day. Why did that go back there? There's nothing back there. <laughs> I thought that's where you wanted to be. Just a curtain, so did a I. man with his own thoughts. Wondering how am I going to live up to Lawrence and Courtney up on this stage? It was a horrible experience. <laughs> James, the White Sox had a workout today, and you got a chance to hear from Chris Gatz and hear from Major Gaval and uh, Garrett Kershaw's thoughts about the strategy of becoming an opener. Let's start with Garrett Crochet because tomorrow's a very big day for him. His first major league start on opening day. How is he feeling? How? What's his mindset going into that start tomorrow? I would say he's confident. Uh, he's uh, he's not an opener since he got asked that about three or four times. Um, um, he was fine. He was chill. He's a big, terrifying ball dude. Um, he talked about. You know, his cutter and having secondaries that he thinks he can land on uh, repeated, a repeated uh, basis. He, he's up to like 80 pitches on his last start. So he thinks basically it'll be decided how long he goes is whether or not he sucks, uh, which I think is, you know, the, the fate every starter wants uh, to be pulled from a game because you're not getting people out and not uh, other reasons. So they're not really tipping their hand as far as like limitations based on pitches or innings right now. They're, they're treating him like a normal starter. I think he's probably going to run into some wall at some point, a la, a la Carlos Rodon in like 2021, but I don't think they're treating him in some like not a real starter type of status because that would be kind of self-defeating. Okay, so crochets on the mound, what are we hoping for? 80 pitches? Is that the kind of limit the White Sox could have? I think you, if you're treating like just a graduation or from his last start, you would expect 90 or above pitches. Now obviously if the Tigers are lighting him up or if he's like, hits a wall and is no longer effective and all of a sudden he walks four guys in any, that kind of pulls him a little bit earlier. But I, I think the ultimate goal is for him to get out a bit over four innings and, and probably get up to 90 pitches. Now, obviously he could pitch effectively or throw secondaries for strikes in maybe a way that we haven't seen before. And all of a sudden we're talking about the sixth inning, but it kind of remains to be seen. I, at least there's the advantage of that 
Just like for the White Sox, throwing a lefty at him kind of makes the Tigers flip their ideal lineup, and he's facing a lot of short side of platoon guys, so I don't think they're running up nine and Kevin Pillar's at them the way that you know the White Sox kind of are at, at Scooble, but there, there's at least something that the White Sox haven't had in the rotation in recent years of you know an actually threatening left-hander. So Jim, this is the most, I think, intriguing part of opening day for the White Sox, is watching Garrett Crochet. What are you hoping to see from Garrett Crochet, or I guess, what do you need to see from Garrett Crochet to make you believe that, you know, the White Sox, this is a good idea, let's try to make him into a starter? First of all, this microphone is very hot after Lawrence got done with it. It's like smoking and molten. I'm not sure if I can follow it up. But when it comes to, like, Crochet, I think, first of all, it's like strikes, which he's been good at so far in spring throwing strikes because he didn't do that last year. I think the other thing is, like, does he have another way of, like, attacking hitters besides throwing fastballs? Like seven out of eight times. Like his slider wasn't impressive in the spring, which sometimes it isn't in the desert, but like he should have a plan of like, if they're looking at my fastball, what else do I have? A uh, slider, a changeup, a cutter, like still trying to figure that out. So he feels like a very much a project, and it's a project we're doing for the White Sox since they have little else to really build. But it does feel like something where like it, he could be. It could be evident that he is not quite ready and they're figuring this out and fly in major league games that count and that could get kind of messy. So again, the gates tomorrow open at 1 o'clock. The parking lot's open at 12 o'clock. That's going to be very important for some of you hosting tailgates. Make sure to be in line to park in the parking lot. So be there like 11 o'clock. I highly recommend doing that. Or it's going to be 2 o'clock and you're setting up your tailgate. And uh, yeah, that's so much fun. But... So Garrett Crochet, big part of opening day. Chris Getz, how's he feeling coming into his first full regular season, James? We mentioned the interview with A.J. Brzezinski, kind of got grilled on foul territory uh, about his feelings. What are his expectations coming into opening day, at least the first couple of months of the season? Um, I don't know him that well. I don't know in the, the depths of his heart and how he feels and you know what, what he sees when he looks into his own eyes in the mirror at night, so I don't, I don't know exactly. We're gonna work on that, right? We're gonna get there. You want me to stay overnight with him at some point? And just kind of see his... Whatever it takes, James. I, I want to, like, pull up what the quote he had was it, but, like, his rallying cry was that he thinks this team will perhaps win more games than people think. Woo! <laughs> I am ready to run through that drywall. So a lot of the things he like describes, like he described the team like having a raised baseball IQ, which like on its surface sounds like you know low key insulting to previous <laughs> teams. <laughs> <laughs> and why would you not insult previous teams? Uh, they, they, they deserved it. But a lot of things he's touting is that oh we're going to throw it to the right base, we're in the right position, we're going to um, you know do, throw the right pitches and the right counts. A lot of things that you kind of expect a major league team to do when you walk into a park given, but also something that if you walked into that major league park in the last three years, you know is not a given. So theoretically, this is like the under-talented team that would execute so well that they catch like more talented teams slipping, which you kind of wonder like, is that really a plan? But you know that the White Sox were the more talented team that was always slipping that like could get beaten by the Royals all the time. So I guess he's kind of envisioning one of those Royals teams. Yeah. She's got so much of the personnel, but... As far as like, it's it's weird because like the real like goal of success for this team is like if they're able to flip Yoan Mankata and Michael Soroka and Eloy Menes and all these one-year guys at the deadline. Like as much as there's like a team identity about oh we want to you know execute, we want to be like fundamentally sound. Like what they really want is build up a lot of assets to like put themselves in a better position for next year because obviously there are limitations about what this team can do this year. You know, if you're doing good things, there'll be like a byproduct if you'll have more guys who are playing well to sell, but it's really not about this team so much in like a very concrete way. So it's hard for them to do the sell job of what we're going to be while also like they're not going to look like this and they're not going to have the same roster. So it's like a weird little dance that they have to do. It's especially jarring to go from like Getz to like Pedro Rafal, who really needs this year to work out for a lot of obvious reasons. Uh, and we'll, we'll kind of see how it shakes out. I imagine it's not like the longest term partnership we've ever seen between like front offs and dugout. Uh, but you know, I don't really have like, I usually say a positive thing to end up like my, my like little paragraphs, but I, I don't have one. And that doesn't seem to be the theme of the night anyway, given our previous act. <laughs> so I'll 
Uh, follow up, James. So, Pedro Grafal, as you mentioned him, the vibes, man. Like, what kind of vibes are you getting off from Pedro uh, going into opening day here? I mean, obviously, he's going to be very excited, and he's going to say all the same things that he usually does. Like, we're here to build a culture. We're here to turn this around. But how much runway do you think this White Sox team and Pedro Grafal have? Because the Tigers... Are a good team. They did say runway a lot, I can tell you that. They, okay, that's good. The second series is against the Atlanta Braves. And the Braves are hoping to win more than 100 games again. And they are a World Series contender. If they look bad, if they're embarrassing on the field, is that okay because of the quality of the talent? Or For Pedro, I don't think it's okay. I mean, I think they need to play like very confidently, otherwise, like, what's their theme of what to do, like if their offense can't hit, uh, you know, standard great brave starter, or like they get shut down by Max Reed, that doesn't like reflect super poorly on their mission, it will be very dispiriting to watch. But I, I, I think if they're not a top 10 defensive team like they top, if none of their starting acquisitions work or even throw strikes, uh, I think that's kind of like, well, what was the deal here? Because he didn't acquire high level arms, he didn't get people who could strike people out. If they can't execute a game plan that like looks compelling or gets them through six innings, it kind of says like, why are we here? What are we doing? What's really the plan? And how are we going to be successful in the future? So I think really just playing a lot of low scoring, boring games that flip on really weird reasons is kind of the goal of the season. I kind of think they're going to be this current Bulls team that really pisses me off all the time because that's my one kernel of fanhood. But without So they can, can they use winning ugly? Can they use? They, can they bring that catch race back, James? If they win, I, 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 yeah, like the, that's the big conditional for the winning part. I, I didn't say how many wins. Um, I was, you know, Gavin's a really nice guy, but I, I couldn't help but like as you said, the team could be Gavin Sheets but over here. My mother in the first row going, oh man, <laughs> <laughs> which I don't know if that could be the slogan instead. <laughs> workouts today, James. <laughs> Mike Soroka's throwing a sinker again? What do you want from me? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> they, they cut Kevin Villar and brought him back to save a little bit of money because they, they needed to? Or? Yeah, so Villar is going to be in the lineup tomorrow. Yeah, alright. Yeah, after, after being released, is, is this like 
the shortest window from being released by a team to being an opening day starter in, this it. in baseball history. Like, on one hand, it's just like he's the platoon player and they need him for the platoon. But yeah, it's, it's a weird situation where, like, his replacement's in the minors. He's not really a starter. They shaved him down, like, what was already, like, a $3 million salary just because that's how strapped the baseball operations budget is, which made me laugh in reference to you asking, like, hey, did they look in on Jordan Montgomery at all? Like, that deal is pretty affordable. Well, I'm like, ha, ha, no, I think they're, like, seeing how they can shave peanut costs, man. I don't think they're <laughs> Jordan Montgomery. Peanut shells? We can't afford that. Shell them. They're getting two nuts in one shell. How can we cut down? We can't do that. We're just giving it away. This is really lifting my spirits. <laughs> Want to talk about gambling sheets some more? <laughs> no. Tarek Skubal, dark horse, American League Cy Young contender, is going to start for Detroit, Jim. And Skubal has been really tough against the White Sox. With the lineup the White Sox have of the players combined, have a 528 OPS against Skubal. Uh, so runs are going to be a premium for the White Sox against Skubal. Offensively, yeah, there's Dion, and I, I'm confident Nicky Lopez. I like Dominic Fletcher. We won't see him tomorrow. But Robert and Ben Attendee and Vaughn and Mikata, like we know how great Robert can be, but Ben Attendee, Vaughn, and Mikata, out of those three, who do you have the most confidence and faith can break out this season and help Luis Robert offensively? I kind of, like Ben Attendee, I've like, mentally ruled out. And I'm not sure why, it just feels like he was part of the previous idea. And now that idea has passed over and it's closed, now he's kind of around. Kind of like James Shields after James Shields trade, like, oh, he's around for two more years. Everybody is disenchanted with him. He might throw 200 innings, nobody feels good about it. It's like, you know, Ben Teddy might hit like 12 homers and like, that would more than double his production last year. And everybody's just like, yeah, all right, he's still the highest paid free agent in White Sox history and nobody feels excited about it and nobody owns this jersey aside from maybe family members or somebody who won a raffle. So like, Does anyone have a Ben Attendee jersey here? No. Yep, there you go. Alright, woo! Largest free agent signing and nobody's got his jersey. Yeah, so like, I've kind of just ruled him out. I feel like it might be unfair because they have, they have a hand injury and the White Sox underestimated. Like they kind of habitually underestimate every injury that ends the previous season. They're like, oh, he'll be okay. Herb Schneider's still around and Herb has a better actor for like a, you know, a decade. But uh, when it comes to like, say, you know, who are the other games you mentioned? So I'm not counting somebody off the... Makata or Vaughn? Because Eloy, Eloy looked good at spring training. He's going to be DH. New swing. Let's I, see if that helps. I feel like it's going to be, this is Vaughn's year to either be good, like a good quality first baseman, or just have the page turn on him because, like, oh, he's going to hit 20 homers, but he can't drive the ball out to the opposite field, and he still swings too many sliders and just grounds too many pitches off the plate into the ground. And uh, they can do better, and the previous administration thought he was untouchable. This administration is not married to him, so, you know, what are they going to do for first base afterwards? It's going to be a long two years while they just kind of wait house arbitration there. So I feel like this is the year where he can either redefine himself or... Uh, the writing is out on the wall when it comes to just like the White Sox need a new idea. So, my kind of, it always feels like every time he steps on first base, I feel like he's going to come up wincing. Uh, so, like, I just can't put faith in him to stay healthy. But, uh, Vaughn, I will say, like, has been healthy. He improved the standard part of his game. He improved, like, not falling apart by September. Now it's just better, like, will he look good from April to August to make that September count? I feel like you, like, just eliminated all your candidates one by one. <laughs> Welcome to Sox Machine. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Let's be optimistic here. The White Sox tomorrow win three to two. Yes. Who is your pick to click? Kevin Plar revenge game. Nice. I, I would look forward to that interview. Man, a couple of days ago. The, uh, the, the GM suite. <laughs> <laughs> Round second points up to Chris Getz. Yeah. Like, yeah, you get it, give me that million dollars back. So we got Kevin Pillar. That's that's a bold one. I like it. How about you, James? Who, who would be your pick to click if the White Sox win tomorrow? Uh, I could cheat and say Luis Robert. But that's I, a good one. I could tell an anecdote. Like, he came back from some injury in Texas. I think it was probably the wrist thing that he should have been playing through. It was like 2022. 
and he like had like two hits, and we we're like, oh, you're feeling pretty good. He's like, no, not really. I just like when I face left-handers because the ball moves toward me instead of away. But I'm feeling feel pretty off. And then they started writing the next three games, and he didn't have another hit. So I was like, oh, Luis was right. So he's facing lefty tomorrow. So even if he's off, he'll, he'll get hit. All right, I like it. I like it. So we got Kevin Pillar, we got Luis Robert. James will be covering all the home games this year for us at Sock Machine. For all the Patreon supporters here, again, always, thank you guys. We will be sending James out on the road. He'll be in Kansas City, Minneapolis, St. Louis, and Milwaukee to cover those games as well for us. So definitely follow him on Twitter if you're not already, at JR Fegan, and of course, read our work at SockMachine.com. James, Jim, thank you guys so much for being here and joining me and providing optimism. That will do it for this special edition Sox Machine podcast, our live show from the Remova Theater. We'll continue to have live podcasts, so if you're interested in an upcoming live podcast, follow us on Twitter. We're at Sox Machine. You can follow us actually on all the social media platforms at Sox Machine. You can follow me at Sox Machine underscore Josh. And of course, follow James at J.R. Fegan. James will be covering all the home White Sox games and we'll be sending him out on the road in large thanks to our wonderful Sox Machine Patreon supporters. If this is the first time you are listening to the Sox Machine podcast, welcome. You can help support us and gain full access to all of our White Sox coverage at patreon.com slash Sox Machine. We also have additional tiers of support where you get more. You can be part of our monthly Zoom calls where you can have informal conversations and gain even more insight about the White Sox from James, Jim, and I. Just a couple examples of benefits. And again, you can sign up at patreon.com slash Sox Machine. Subscribe to the Sox Machine podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. And we also do videos as well. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Sox Machine. The Sox Machine Podcast is a production of SoxMachine.com. You're on for all things Chicago White Sox baseball and part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm Josh Nelson. Thanks for listening and watching. Purchase new wiper blades from O'Reilly Auto Parts today and we'll install them for free. See better and drive safer with O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts.